Dear Father, thank you for the second lesson for this quarter. We are embarking into the study of the family and yet we're laying the biblical foundations and the grounds for our studies. We've done uh, our study on the rhythms of life. We will now talk about choices and decisions we need to make. One of the greatest gifts you've given your creatures, dear Father, is the power of choice. We are moral beings who can make a choice for and against you. May we understand this special gift in the light of your grace and come to appreciate the good news of salvation that made it possible for a choice that has been broken and fallen to be restored, that we might be saved into your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So, as I've said, we began with uh, the rhythms of life last week, if you remember. What are the rhythms of life? Cleo, you make a good student here. Communion. Three C's. Communion, community, community and compassion. All right? So, Christ went in the solitude to commune with God. And then he picked 12, associated with his disciples, and then he started serving the people. So, now we will talk about the choices we make. Uh, like I said, the lesson is very subtle, right? He, the lesson doesn't go straight to family. Uh, I guess where, where the lesson goes is choosing your life partner, your spouse, all right? I have a very big question in the end too we will tackle. Uh, the ratio of men to women in the church is two is to one. Okay. More women than men? Yeah, I did not say which two or one, okay? Two women. Men to woman, you said two to one. Two women 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 to so we will discuss in the end, very controversial topic, the call to singleness, <laughs> and blessed singleness. And we'll, we'll talk about that. So without foundations, you will not be able to answer that properly. But if you know the biblical foundation, it'll be easier to answer that. Because where I came from, I did a series in Arizona, and there were two blessed single women in the church. And one of the single women is an elder. So it's possible for that to happen. All right. So. The choices we make. Family seasons. All right. You got your Bibles? I want you to go to your Bibles so we can go. These are, there are three passages that will, actually, well, three sets of passages that will help us. Uh, D.A. Carson probably wrote one of the better books on divine sovereignty and human responsibility, Biblical Perspectives and Detention. There's another book by Norman Geisler entitled Chosen But Free. But uh, if you want the biblical treatment of the subject, D.A. Carson's book will serve you. Okay? If you have, want to read the more readable book, it's uh, Chosen by Free by Norman Geisler. But uh, D.A. Carson talks about a doctrine of what we call compatibilism. Don't let the word uh, scare you we get this word from the word compatible, right? You know what the compatible means, right? When you are looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend, are we compatible? You know, it's got to be compatible. Uh, the contention of D.A. Carson and a bunch of biblical scholars is that God's sovereignty is compatible with human responsibility, right? You may not understand it, but they're compatible. That's why it's called compatibilism. Does he believe that God knows the beginning from the end and he has ordained things to happen and nobody can quell that because he's sovereign? Yes, he does. But does he also believe that man is responsible in responding to God? Yes, he does. I mean, logically, you will try to bend your mind. You will not be able to understand that. And yet the Bible teaches both. That's why he says, because the Bible teaches both, I will believe both. Okay, so the only question is you want to know when to believe using the sovereignty perspective or the responsibility perspective. How many of you know Eli Seriano? Eli Seriano? 
Elisiriana is an offshoot of the Iglesia and Iglesia, the Church of Christ. He's a very popular guy. Um, he said uh, there was only one Seventh-day Adventist that made my knees shake. <laughs> that was uh, Ernesto Gutierrez, okay? Ernie, Pastor Ernie Gutierrez. He was my professor in college, a very smart guy. Uh, he said, I cannot go head to head with Ernie Gutierrez because it's really good. But when Pastor Gutierrez was earning his master's degree, he sat down, his panel was Dr. Lawrence Eldridge, Sidney Allen, Oosterwald, those, those missionaries were again. So he, so he was doing, I think, a master's on Daniel. And he said, uh, when he was talking about Daniel, I think it was Dr. Allen, he said, uh, how many Daniels, how many authors did Daniel have? <laughs> you know, like people believe that if they, it was Daniel, Daniel cannot predict what happened in Middle Persia, you know, or Greece because he was living during that time. So they said, one Daniel wrote it when in 600 BC, and then another Daniel wrote it after the fact. So a liberal says they got to be two Daniels. And then Pastor Gutierrez said, uh, uh, as far as I know, there's only one Daniel, one author of the book of Daniel. And then the next uh, panelist said, are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Yes. Okay. Here's the way Pastor Gutierrez answered it. I cannot forget it. He was telling me the story. Sir, I am liberal when I'm supposed to be liberal, and I'm conservative when I'm supposed to be conservative. <laughs> After he said that, I think it was Sidney Allen Judd. Lawrence, I'm done. <laughs> so he earned his master's degree. That's compatibilism, okay? I will recognize God's sovereignty when I'm supposed to recognize it, and I will recognize human responsibility when the Bible context tells me to recognize human responsibility. That's compatibilism, right? As long as you understand that, all right? So, same question I ask you. Is it possible for your children to break your heart when they grow up? Yes. Particularly when they go to teenage years. Oh, we had a very heavy topic this morning in the high school class. It was about Joseph and Potiphar's wife. <laughs> so, what was the topic? The topic was about sex. And you're talking to high school kids. High school kids, and we eventually in the end we said, we got to admit, the hormones shout during the teenage years, and they're so powerful. You can pray, you know, but unless you really love God and learn to love God and dwell with Him, you won't be able to have power against the temptation. Teenage years is the rebellious years. That's the next question of, of John Lennox. Is, if your teenagers can break your heart, why do you still have kids? Why still have kids? I told you this. This is one of my favorite slides. Because if they can break your hearts, they can also learn to love you. The only way you can have children loving you is to have children. And the only way your children can love you is for you to allow them to rebel or to love you. Otherwise, it will be right. Yes, there. I think that should be the whole point of the cross, almost. Sir. Sure. I've thought about this a lot. What happens if Adam and Eve didn't eat that? That was an apple. Mm -hmm. There wouldn't be no rebellion. There wouldn't be no, you know what I mean? Sure. So how will we learn to love God? I mean, you know what I mean? Well, that's why when you read Romans 5, that's why the second Adam was set, so that God's grace could be more gracious. It could be more glorious. I, I always say this when I when I give a study on the book of Revelation. The reason for worship when you start Revelation is because God created the whole world. But in the end, what's the reason for worship? It was because the Lamb has been slain. The most powerful testimony to the glory of God in the whole universe is not His creation, but the cross of Jesus Christ, as small as it was. Because a God so great, as eternal as God, can be so small within the space-time continuum and even subject himself to die. That's why Philippians 2 was saying, saying he humbled himself even to the point of death. That's why at, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will bow. Why? Because Jesus humbled himself even unto death. And because of that great love, nothing can surpass the testimony of God's glory. And you fall down in worship. And that's what I'm just saying. So... 
And that's where pastor is saying the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It's the goodness of God, the fact that God still loves you. Uh, I'll give an example. I was babysitting my grandkid this week, you know, while I was doing something on the table. Lily kept on pulling on their curtain. And then before I knew it, I heard a psh, crash. She, she pulled it right off of the screws. There were three screws. And he went down and she looked at me. She was about to cry, you know. <laughs> she was, so me, she didn't know what to do. I just went and hugged Lily. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay, it's okay baby, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. That, but that's, that's how God is. I mean, we, we mess up. God's there and the cross is right there. The pastor said, how, how badly you messed up. God's still there. How can you not worship a God like that? So, I mean, and that's why she became real. You think, I said, come on, hug me. No. When I came to her and hug her, she started hugging me because she knew I was there. So here's the, the context of what we will study, okay? You cannot make choices unless there is, still, there is a choice to make. Are you following? Right? And the way to understand the choices that, God, that we make for God is to understand the callings of God. There are three levels of calling. This Kajitani analyzed the Puritans, and they said there, there are three levels of calling. The first level of calling is the highest calling. The highest calling of the Bible is a calling to salvation. It's communion with Christ. And everybody is called to that. And unless you accept Jesus Christ, you will not be saved. Okay? The second level of calling is the common callings, which are biblical commands for all at all times in all places. You know, regardless, the Ten Commandments is there. You follow the Ten Commandments. Be kind one to another. Love one another. These are common callings that all of us are accountable to. But there's a third kind of calling called specific callings. It's just what God directs to be accomplished. You know, there's, there's a calling to marry. There's a calling to get a degree. There's a calling to, you know, to, to find a vocation. How do you decide that? You don't find that in the Bible, right? So we'll talk about that in a little while. So based on these callings, we will process what kind of decision we need to make, what choices we need to make, okay? Uh, real quickly. Sure. Uh, grace in the discipleship process. Uh, I, I, we won't have time to look at this, but... I'll, I'll, you can download the handouts in, the, in YouTube. Uh, but seeking, exploring, beginning, growing, and maturing. Prevenient grace is what Pastor was talking about this morning. Even before you accepted Jesus Christ, God has been running away, run, running after you. God is in pursuit of you, the hound of heaven. Like they said, prevenient grace allows you, you know, God allows somebody to die. God, God allows you to lose uh, your job. God allows you to have a problem. So that you are awakened to his, your need of him. That's prevenient grace. I, I, other than that, you will not give him the time of day. Okay, after the prevenient grace, you accept Jesus Christ. That's going to be justifying grace. As soon as you are saved by God's justifying grace, you will now grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus, which is sanctifying grace. So, but from beginning to end, it will still be grace. So, what did I pick? One verse for the lesson. It's Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Okay? Do it not unto men, but unto the Lord. That's the basic. And that's the three qualities of choices that we make as disciples. First, it is an encompassing choice. Second, it is an enthusiastic choice. And third, it's an extolling choice. Okay? If, if, I just made it three E so you can remember. Encompassing means all of life. It's a choice for all of life. Enthusiastic means there's life. Okay, there's passion. Okay, extolling it. It should be worshipful. Praise, praise, praising God. All right. So the first part is encompassing. It says whatever you do. There's this one guy. Used to like him because that was my old name. <laughs> His name is Eusebius. Right about the time of Constantine, third and fourth century. He introduced a concept in the church called the perfect life and the permitted life. What is the perfect life? The perfect life is the life of the monks and the priest in the monastery. They were supposed to be shielded from the world because the world was evil. 
Okay? What's the permitted life? So you have the farmer. You have the baker. You have the potter. Right? You know, the peasants right there in the streets, not in the monastery. That's a secondary grade of piety. That's what he said. So there's a, there's a, a division between that of God and that of man. Remember, see the division that we've been talking about? Remember this division that we still have today? It's the division between clergy and what? And lady. And you, I, I know we had that ordination service this morning. But is there something mystical about ordination that when you're ordained, some, for some reason you become higher than everybody else? No, that's not the concept of ordination. Okay? But because that has been introduced by Eusebius in church history, people now think that as soon as you're, order, you're ordained, you have a special status in church. Ordination, last pastor is saying, is nothing more than a confirmation that you're gifted in becoming a deacon, gifted in service, so you'll be, you'll be, a, you'll, you'll be a, a servant in the church. That doesn't mean you're better than the other guy. Okay? That's, 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 that still holds true for the ministry. I will throw this in. Why not? Okay? Why are you ordained as a pastor? You're ordained as a pastor because, because without being ordained, you won't be able to marry. You know, a lot of things that the pastor normally does. But does that mean you're better, you're higher than the regular member? No. It means the state will recognize you. Oh, yeah. Yes, and then from a state, from a state standpoint, that's right. And if you're a lawyer, you're gonna be, you cannot operate in the operating room because you're a lawyer. You can go to the court and neither, neither can the doctor defend you because you got your own calling, right? So you, you have your own side. And that's the way to put it. But from the standpoint of God, there is no such thing as clergy here and lady down here. There's only one Laos. There's only one people of God, one royal priesthood. But Eusebius introduced this. And what was his teach? What what he's teaching? He's saying there, the perfect life is spiritual, is contemplative. There's the things of heaven, and there's a life in the church. So you become a priest, you become a monk, go to the monastery. You will have the perfect life. If you're not a monk and you're not a priest, you are second class. Okay, because the permitted life is the physical, the active, the things of the earth, and life in the world. Asking has basically said. This two-tier view of calling flagrantly perverted biblical teaching, here, clergy and lady, narrows the sphere of the calling. In other words, there's a special calling for a pastor, and a special calling to be a medical technologist, a special calling to be an architect, a special calling to be a street sweeper, okay? And then it includes most, excludes most Christians from its scope. That's so why people feel, oh, if I'm not a pastor, I probably won't be doing this. Okay? If I'm not an ordained elder, an ordained deacon, I will not be serving the church. Because that's a mistaken notion. So what did Martin Luther say? A cobbler, a smith, a peasant, each has the work and the office of his trade. And yet they are all alike consecrated priests and bishops. In this way, many kinds of work may be done for the bodily and spiritual welfare of the community, just as all the members of the body serve one another. For Martin Luther, salvation is a gift by faith, so is vocation. That's, that, that's where the theology of vocation. Um, example. Yeah, everybody ate in the potluck, right? And so, of course, Filipinos eat rice. What if you happen to eat the bread? You know, if you don't eat rice, you table for this bread. How did you come to have bread during the potluck? During our time, you go to Jew. <laughs> you buy the thing or you go to Costco to the Sam. In your time of Jesus, there's no Costco, no Sam's. You got to get the flour, right? <laughs> you got to need the flour. You got to bake the bread. And then you got to put the little milk there and then then, once it's, then you can bake it, and then you can serve it on the table. What goes into that bread that you're eating? Oh, the farmer needs to plant the source of the flour. The maid needs to milk the cow to get the milk. And then the transporter must get the milk and put it to take it to the market. So does he do it for the flour? It takes it to the market. Once he does it, Somebody will have to buy the flour and put them together. So all of that from the maid to the farmer, all the way to the one that, to, that bakes it, works together so that somebody can eat. Are you following? 
And that's what Martin Luther is saying. God ordained all of these gifts in his creation so that we can survive. That is the reason why creation lives, because of his creators, okay? the creatures that he did right there. That's why he concludes, we conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and the neighbor. He lives in Christ through faith and his neighbor through love. So where are you eating bread right now from the, the maid that milked the cow and from the farmer? Uh, Benji, are you still working? Okay, so you're, you're a clinical scientist, you're a medical technologist, right? So you got to, what product comes out of your gift? Yeah. All the blood drawn. All right. Well, so, so, <clears throat> somebody get somebody get to get some blood transfusion and it's that. You gotta go to the lab. You gotta figure that out. You can just dispense the blood without going to the lab to figure out if it's yeah, your compatibility and you got other stuff. Can you imagine if you're not there to figure out the compatibility, that patient can die. So therefore. Even if Benji is not the doctor, maybe it's Michai who is the doctor, the cardiologist in this particular patient. Even if Benji is not the, the, the main contact of the doctor, without Benji, there will be no blood for the patient to have a transfusion. The patient will die. So by chain reaction, all of these are put together by God so that his creation can flourish. And that's what Martin Luther is saying. That's why every, every vocation it's dignified. There's dignity in whatever you do. Uh, let me say it now. You know, the work of a surgeon is as noble as the work of the street sweeper. Yeah, that's why one writer is saying, if you're a street sweeper, sweep the street the way Michelangelo can paint, you know, the Last Supper. Okay, so this is the product, okay? Celibacy became faithfulness to marriage. Remember what they're teaching? I don't, have to, I don't want to bring this up, but there's one major problem with the Roman Catholic Church today, right? What's the problem with the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really fascinated. A lot of Adventists keeps on giving me these messages about the Pope, you know, have you seen this? And really, the main problem of the Vatican today is not the Pope. The main problem of the Vatican today is a lot of sex cases and scandals, even archbishops, right? Right? Why did this happen? Because of the celibacy. Yeah. What's the teaching of celibacy? To abstain from marriage. Yeah. Uh, that's why they're saying, even the nuns are saying, hey, it's part of your divine calling not to get married because that's part of your service to God. That's why they're yeah. nuns. <laughs> that's it. It's it. Remember, remember that piece I was reading about? The priest was, went into the archives of the monastery, started reading the books. He started crying. <laughs> the priest started crying. And the other priest came, why are you crying? Why are you crying? So we, mis we misread it. We misread it. All these years, we thought it was celebrate. In fact, it was celebrate. <laughs> so we only celebrated marriage. We could have been married as priests and nuns. We would have no problem like this. But what happened? Celibacy, when Luther gave, what, what did Luther do? He translated the Bible to German so that the farmer, the baker, the peasants can read the Bible the way the monks can read the Bible. And then what did he do? And I like to always say this. Instead of singing all the chants in the monastery, he composed songs from the bar in the tavern so that the ordinary people can sing songs of praise to God. So celibacy becomes faithfulness to marriage, poverty and ascetism becomes hard work, obedience is submission to the law, even the law of the land, and prayer, meditation, and worship was not confined to the church or the monastery or the cathedral. It extended into the family and the workplace. This is very important. Why? Because there is no difference between sacred and secular. There's no clergy and lady, sacred and secular divide. What's the moment you understand that? that all of God's calling and choices, therefore, is all of life. What? That means there is no distinction. What does that mean? When God calls me, how much of me should I give? The common answer, I don't only give him one day in a week so that, so that I go here, I go here, I go here every, every week, I attend every Sabbath, and then after Saturday, Sunday, Monday, 
I don't follow him anymore. So, um, just as God is working through the vocation of others to bless us, he's working through us to bless others. In our vocations, we work side by side with God as it were taking part in his ceaseless creative activity and laboring with him as he providentially cares for his creation. Okay, what's the verse that go with this? Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Okay, did God give you an assignment? 1 Corinthians 7, 17, yes. I mean, if you're a clinical scientist, if you're a nurse, if you're a nurse, if you're a nurse, if you are a, if you're a nurse, if you're a doctor, if you're a lawyer, if you're an architect, God assigned you to do that. So, uh, as long as you follow that, you'll be okay. And then there's this one guy, Andy Crouch, who said, if there is a constructive way forward for Christians in the midst of our broken but also beautiful cultures, it will require us to recover these two biblical postures of cultivation and creation. This is an award-winning book entitled Culture Making, written by Andy Crouch, one of the best church growth authors that we have. All he's trying to say is, we must retake the culture. What's the meaning of retake the culture? Oh, we always complain, oh, look at what you watch on the movies. You know, this, this destroys the minds of our children. But how many of you saw the, the film, I Can Only Imagine? Have you heard of I Can Only Imagine? That's a, it, 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 won, it, it earned over 80 million, 80 million in, in profits in the box office. That's a Christian film. They produce Christian film today, The Passion of the Christ. All he's saying is, instead of us getting scared of culture, we must take culture to glorify God. So he's saying, we should produce Christians who are filmmakers, we should produce Christians who are musicians, so that we can take over culture. That's what he's saying, because you're supposed to cultivate and create, procreate. We'll go to that in a little while. And Sky Gitani always asks this question. The question is, the, the question we normally ask is, do we evacuate or do we cultivate? It's very, very practical here. You know, because Adventism is a prophetic movement, what is our teaching most of the time? Our teaching is, come on, come on, come on. The Sunday law is coming. Jesus is about to come. So evacuate, evacuate, evacuate. Leave the cities, go to the mountains, right? The perspective is evacuate. And because if your perspective is evacuate, how much good do you do to the society? Not a whole lot. Because really the main, first mandate of God is not to evacuate, but to cultivate what's given to you and stand for your right and allow God to change the society. Um, you can download this. This is my vocation to strangers, to co-workers, to neighbors, to family, to friends. Uh, you have your being, what I am, placed by God. You have your calling, what I am called to do, as compelled by God. You have your passions, what I love and pursue, as gifted by God. This is, I think, a very good concept of what the Puritans thought, okay, this their view of education. One, God the prime creator initiates all things through his original creation of everything. Number two, humans discover what God has made and this discovery is a big part of what education is about. Number three, humans imitate God by making secondary creations based upon their discovery and understanding of his primary creation. And number four, God is glorified through the imitation of him in human occupations of all kinds. How many of you have computers? Everybody does. What makes the computer run? We, we, yeah, there's a ton of stuff, but the main driver for your computer is the computer chip. You know where they make the chip from? Yeah, silicon. Where, where did you get this? It eventually goes from the sand. Okay, somebody gets something very worthless puts that together, <clears throat> eventually turns it into a computer, something worthwhile. Lily was watching Eden yesterday, going to the sewing machine. Somebody gets a piece of cloth, put things together, and turns that into, into a dress, goes to the market. That piece of cloth, which is not worth a, a while, can sell for 30, 40 bucks in the market because you created that. That's what we call a reflection of God's creation. 
And that's part of vocation. That's what the Puritan knowledge is. So the first point is everything in life is a choice for God. It's a calling. You're called. Okay? And you must have an encompassing choice. Right. Then what's the second part? Work at it with all your heart. Very good diagram. They call it the Y diagram. In the final analysis, there are only two kinds of decision that you make. There is an easy decision. There is a hard decision. Okay? One decision is driven by feelings, where the king is yourself. And eventually, if you allow your feelings to control you and yourself to run your choices, life gets harder. Okay? You develop your habits based on the choices that you make. Okay? And the other kind of decision is you allow Christ and the gospel and the scripture to drive your choices. And the king here is God. Life gets easier generally. Okay? And then this point here, you got the inner man here. It starts with your mind. It goes to your heart. Uh, might as well give this to you. There are, there are four H's that I've always shared with you. And it comes your, to your choices. You have your... This is your hands. This is your heart. This is, this is your head, right? Start with your head. Think. It must go to your heart. As soon as it goes to your heart, begins to love and understand what you've learned, it goes to your hand. You apply what you've heard. And what else? You go into your heel to understand what God wants you to do as your calling. Okay. And then you guys know this sequence. Remember the sequence? You start with a motive. Right? After you have a motive, what comes after a motive? You go into an action. Okay? And after you make an action repeatedly, what, what happens after this? It turns into a habit. And the moment you get uh, all these habits, you will have your character. And your character determines your destiny. Everybody knows this. One guy who was studying the Bible with us noticed that all of this has a T. Right? So you got the motive, you got the action, you got the habit, you got the character, you got destiny. So the cross must be the center over there. It, it's just, just a coincidence. All right? So as long as you understand that choices eventually okay, must, must be either God-driven. And what he's just saying is if you are driven by Christ and the gospel and the grace of God, that choice will be a hard choice. Okay? Uh, let me explain that. Man is made of three parts. What are the three parts of man? Body, soul, and spirit. Your body is your bias, which is the physical world. Suke is your soul, which is the psychological world. And spirit, which is Numa, the call where we contact God and communicate with God. That's why, can a dog and a cat sin? No, they can't, because they're not spiritual beings. Only human beings are spiritual beings who can communicate with God. And this is the way the enemy works. The enemy works from the outside to our hearts. So based on what we taste, sound, we see, what we smell, and what we touch, Satan gives us temptation. And he intensifies that physical attraction, okay? He affects our mind. And then he would, then we are grieved and quenched and the conscience is gone. One of the, we were talking about the high school, Sabbath school class this morning. One of the biggest problems in churches today is internet pornography. Right? Have you heard about that? Internet pornography starts with, they sound here, right here. Starts with this. But how does God work in your life? He doesn't start on the outside. God starts with your conscience, your communion with him. It starts from within going outside. And as soon as he hits your conscience, your in, in, intuition, your communion, it will fortify your will. And after it fortifies your will, then your body will respond accordingly. So there's, there's taste, sound, sight, smell at the back end, but he starts from the very beginning, right? 
So, Bob Parker, Parker Palmer basically summarized it by saying, true vocation joins self and service. As Frederick Buchner asserts when he defines vocation as the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. Your calling must be an answer to a deep need of your neighbor of the world. And to be a true disciple, you must answer that need with deep gladness. Did you get that? So assuming you help out tomorrow in the outreach, but you gradually do it. You might as well not do it. Okay? You must delight in what God is saying. So here's a summary, and I won't go to the details of this. You guys can download it. This. this is the flow of discipleship. You start with evangelism. Then you start with establishing. It must be established in the faith. These are the seven basics. Assurance of salvation, quiet time, Bible study, scripture memory, prayer, evangelism, and fellowship. And then there's equipping where you start joining small groups. Then after you're equipped, you will be entrusted to do some work for him as a worker and a laborer. From a non-believer or convert to the disciple, worker, and laborer. But all of this will eventually be a heart service for God. Lastly, Ask for the Lord and not for men. All right, look at the left side first. Uh, there are things people get paid to do, okay? And there are things that you enjoy. And there are things that you're good at, right? And he's saying if you, are, if you enjoy doing something and you're good at it, more than likely it's a hobby, Right? when they pay you to do it but you really and you're good at it but you really don't love doing it it's a drag you're paid you might as well go because i'm paid i need the money okay in the same token if, if things if people get you're paid to do the stuff and you enjoy this this is only a dream that really didn't happen there's something missing here that's something that's missing is mission so this is this is the way i like to put it and this is from a, a Japanese concept. It's the meaning of life. That which you love, that which the world needs, that which you can be paid for, that which you are good at. If you get all the intersection of this, you will find purpose in your life. Here's a better rendition. This is Igigai. Igigai. Igi, ikigai is the Japanese term. Coming from iki meaning life and kai meaning the realizations of hope and expectations. It's life's purpose, basically. And we go back to that. He's saying, if you have, uh, if you have, if you do what you love and you answer the world's needs, but you have no income, <laughs> you'll have delight and fullness, but you have no wealth. It's going to be tough, all right? If you do what you love, okay, and do what you're good at, there is satisfaction, but there's a feeling of uselessness because you do not answer the need of the world. Okay? Now, if you're good at this and you're being paid for that, you can be comfortable. But after a while, money becomes empty. You become empty. Okay? Then if you know what the world needs are and you get paid for, there is excitement and complacency, but the sense of uncertainty. Okay? Because you're paid for it. Just give this thing, but you have no purpose in life. So what you need to do is you grab all of this, and go to the center with your purpose. The moment you get to the purpose, you cannot have a better condition in life if you are doing what you love, answering what the world needs, and you're getting paid for it, and you're good at what you're doing. This is really cool. That's why a lot of Japanese are successful. This is the, this is the counsel of their coach. You know what you need to do to your life? Look for the ikigai. Ikigai is what you want to look for. But why don't you get that? You will get the purpose of your life, okay? So, follow me carefully. So, now, so you will look at, we look at the purpose in life. There's another diagram that you have here. Uh, this is the diagram of your life. What do you spend the most time doing every day? How many hours of sleep do you have? Eight. You normally sleep eight. How many hours do you spend eating? Okay, about one and a half hours. By the time you're done, 
this is your physiological tax. You gotta eat, you gotta sleep, okay? You gotta rest. So you can do anything about this. That takes it out of your life. If you don't do that, you're gonna die. So that's your physiological tax. And a lot of people, if you work, if you're balanced, you give time for your work, you get time for your relationships, and then you give time for yourself. The whole idea is how do you balance all of this? And your choices are affected by this. Okay, is my relationship more important than my work? That affects the distribution. And is time for solitude more important than that? How do you evaluate it? I'm just giving this, this guideline so it can help you. Have a grid, okay? Important and not important, okay? So number one, if it's important and it's urgent, do it right away, okay? If it's urgent but it's not important, you really don't need to do it, right? If it's not urgent, it's not important, maybe put it in the back shelf. But if it's not urgent and yet it's important, saying you probably should give pay attention. You know what they observe? People are workaholics, normally goes to the first quadrant. They do everything. Rush, 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 rush. No, no time to take. But he said, what we need to do is spend more time on the important things, even if it's not urgent. You know why? Because it will serve in the long run to resolve them because it will be beneficial to us in the end. All right. Vocation, like Tim Keller is saying, says your work matters to God and God matters to your work. What is he trying to say? If, you, if you're a med tech, if you're a computer scientist, if you're a nurse, if you're a caregiver, if you're an engineer, if you're an architect, what you do matters to him. So if you're a pilot, what's the most Christian thing to do? I love the way Tim Keller puts it. If you're a pilot, you're a Christian pilot, the most Christian thing to do is to land the plane, right? Yes, safely. safely. That's your responsibility. God called you to be a pilot. And that responsibility of landing a plane is as important as the guy standing behind the pulpit and giving you a sermon. Are you following? That's what he's trying to say. So that is... Work matters to God, whatever you do. But in the same token, God matters to your work because if you're responsible in what you do, you know what happens? You give a witness to God and, and people will understand who your God is. So this, this is the four ways the gospel transforms your work. Because it gives you a new identity in Christ, work will not sink you. Because the gospel gives you a dignity of labor Work will not bore you. Because the gospel gives you a moral compass, you, it will not corrupt your work. You will be honest in your job. You will have integrity. And because you have a new worldview in Jesus Christ, your work will not enslave you. You are not working to be a slave of your job. You have the right perspective. Okay? Okay, which takes us to the last part. This is... a. Uh, Market survey among heterosexual couples and same-sex couples. Uh, we now come to the choice of having a wife or a spouse. How do you come up with the decision who to marry? According to statistics, still the number one among heterosexual couples is through friends. Your friends introduce you to another friend. Uh, People still meet them, their significant other in a bar or a restaurant, <laughs> Starbucks, okay? And some people meet them in church, but it's slowly, de quickly declining now. And then uh, people also meet themselves online. I put this in there. I didn't want to put it in here, but notice what's the, what's the most popular way for same-sex couples to connect? Online, okay. Google. Take it with a grain of salt, but you know there's implications of this graph. I just have to put that in there. I have to put this in there. <coughs> Love does not consist in gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. This is my quote. We did it for the longest time. When we were married, I put this as the quote in a wedding invitation, because really the way for love to flourish between a man and a woman is to have three parties. Where are the three parties? God must be in the top of the triangle, and you got the husband and the wife. Notice what happens. The closer the husband and the wife are to God, the closer they are to each other. Do you see that? 
uh, put some verses here to, to help to help you understand what abiding in Christ, knowing the truth. But the bottom line is, and I always say this, I tell my kids as well, you know, before you can even commit to a girl or a guy, you must first commit to Jesus Christ. And before you even go out with a girl, make sure that that girl is committed to Christ first. Are you following? You see, the only way you can truly find love for each other is for the both of you to love God first. Are you following? It's a very general principle. How do you look for a mate? Look for a mate who is in love with God, right? And more than that, there's, there's two steps. Fall in love with God first as a, as a human being, and then look for a friend who's in love with God as well. And then you can be close and go there. Basically, when further from God, the distance between husband and wife is greater. When closer to God, the husband and wife will be closer to each other. Now we go to the challenge that I gave you. Here's the big challenge, okay? One to two for single people, two men, three women. It's really, the ratio is not as bad as, you know. So, I don't know if we can have time to do this, but. This is what happened in the church in history. Marriage and family was almost universal. Okay? In the New Testament, singleness and marriage were equally valued. Marriage was most frequent. During the Gnostic times in the 2nd and 3rd century, celibacy was introduced. You know what celibacy is, right? You don't get married. This, if you're single, you're more devoted and you're more Christian. You're more devoted than other Christians. Okay? The reformers reversed that and started emphasizing the duty of marriage. Remember, Martin Luther was a Benedictine monk. Was Martin Luther ever married? Yes, he did. He got married, okay? Uh, and then in the 20th century, there's emphasis on marriage and family. You had focus on the family by James Dobson. There's a ton of family sites now, okay? And in the 1980s, people begin to realize, oh, not everybody can get married, so we will start including singleness. Okay. Uh, there are factors here. You can read that when you download it. Here's the bottom line. Is it possible to live a single life happily? Actually, I want to open up a can of worms. There are some Christians who, because of cultural conditioning, are prone to same sex, right? They're homosexuals. Okay, yeah. But the point, though, is what if you have a Christian who is, who is, is gay? Can a gay Christian serve God? No. Oh. Gay or effeminate cannot go to heaven. All right. You got to understand the verse that you're saying. The verb used in the effeminate, uh, the word used in the, the effeminate is a verb. Paul is saying if you're actively engaged in the gay lifestyle, which means the same sex, you know, act. There's no way you're going to go to heaven because it's an aberration. But is it possible to have gay tendencies and control those tendencies? Yeah, if you can be controlled. Yes. Otherwise, you end up like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why they call it the sexual celibacy. Yes. If you so happen you've been, you've been conditioned culturally to have that kind of attraction within you, and you know it's not a acceptable in terms of your understanding of the Bible, what you need to do is just to be celibate. In other words, hey, don't engage with the act. Okay? And I'll give you an illustration. I used to work with an elder who had the tendency. He was never married, but he was an elder of the church. Um, so I... Anatomical difference, you know. In sure, the sure. Structure. But I mean, but the call to singleness can be true to anybody. If you, if you cannot be yeah. married to an unbeliever, the, the concept of the scriptures, don't get married to an unbeliever, then remain single. Okay, and if you have some 
tendencies which is not normal, then just stay single. That's why there are reasons to stay single. And by being single, you glorify God. Um, take heart, okay? Paul never took a wife. He probably was married because he was a Pharisee for starters. But towards the end, what did Paul say? I prefer not to have a wife because if I have a wife, there's going to be a lot of barriers in my ministry. Okay, l let me clarify that, okay? Wherever I go, when I'm invited, I do not go alone. Oh, Eden always comes with me. You know why? Today, it's better to have a wife with you <laughs> when you go out, right? Because if you're by yourself, you know, with all the problems we have right now in the moral looseness among the evangelical megachurches and all, it's better for you to have, you know, yeah, yeah, the purity with your wife will be there. You don't go out. In fact, when we had the eldest retreat, we were supposed to have accountability partners. You know, we will pray with people and study with them once a month. We said it's got to be gender specific. If you're a guy, you do not go with a girl. If you go with the girl, you better go with your wife while you meet with each other because it's going to be very intimate. The bottom line is Paul was the most active in Christian duty, and yet he did not have a wife when he finished his apostolic duty. Is it possible to be single and be a good disciple of Jesus Christ? Yes, it is. There's, there's one very important thing. It is only possible if for you the most important thing is God. Because if you think your, your physical needs is still important, it will be very difficult for you to remain celibate while you worship God okay, and serve Him. This is again another, another outline. You can read this thing. Let me just go through this very quickly. Principles for Biblical Decision Making. Uh, you start with God's Word as the foundation. You must have an accurate concept of God. God is not a God to fear. He's a God of love who woos you every day. You must acknowledge God's sovereignty. You must walk with God every day, pray for direction. You must seek wise counsel. You must trust and have a surrendered heart. And you must wait on God's timing. Uh, here's the question I have. When it comes to the, your ultimate calling, your ultimate calling is a calling of salvation. More, more than likely, it is a call of God, the Father, right? God calls you to be saved. When it comes to a common calling, it's the call of the Scriptures. You go to the Scriptures to understand all your common callings. What do you follow? When it comes to your specific calling, you, get, you don't find that in the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell you who to marry. It will give you principles, right? So who helps you decide in your specific calling? It's the Holy Spirit, right? But how does the Holy Spirit help you decide? He doesn't whisper to you and just from, from out of heaven one day he gives a big boom and tells you the, the answer. No. He uses the church to help you. You know what that means? You got to go to your brothers and sisters in church. Seek godly counsel. They will give you counsel. The body of Christ will help you decide. So it is good for people looking for a partner in life not to look for the partner by him or solo. Confer with the elders, compare with the pastors, compare with other brothers and sisters in Christ that you're close with. And the body of Christ and the Spirit can help you do that. Okay, We're landing now. Two more slides and we're done. Hobby Lobby. You know Hobby Lobby, right? You know the landmark ruling, the victory they won at the Supreme Court. Uh, upheld the rights of Hobby Lobby to structure their health, you know, health benefits to not compromise their Christian principles. They were taken to court for that, and they won that battle. Okay? Honoring, the Lord, honoring the Lord in all we do by operating the company in a matter consistent with biblical principles. That is the mission statement of Hobby Lobby. I think what Hobby Lobby has about 15,000 employees, about 800 stores in, in the country. But what do they do in this vocation, in this particular calling? If they honor the Lord in all that they do, their health benefits, their employee benefits is based on the scriptures. The way they treat their employees is with dignity. And the way they run the policies in the employees is very Christian. And because in the vocation that Hobby Lobby has, you have Christian principles permeating Hobby Lobby. That becomes a testimony to the glory of God. All right? So lastly, I always 
end this with when we study the vocation and calling. Before we are called to something, before we are called to somewhere, we are first called to someone. I had the privilege of training uh, 50 voice of youth teams in the, in the Philippines, in the AUP. So I spent about a week for them. And then that summer, they were deployed to do evangelism all over the Philippines. And this was my last slide to those students. I said, before I go called to a project, an evangelistic project, before you are called somewhere in the Philippines to do your evangelism, you are first called to Jesus Christ. So how do I summarize the lesson? The way I summarize the lesson is, what's the most important choice you make? The most important choice you make is to come to Jesus first. And once you come to Jesus, he will enable you to fulfill your common callings. And as soon as you associate with the body of Christ, he will even enable you to determine what vocation you should go in, okay, your specific calling. So may, may those three callings, let's repeat, whatever we covered, there is an ultimate calling, there are common callings, and there are specific callings. How do we respond to those callings? How do we make our choices and our decision making? What's our key text? Whatever you do, it must be encompassing. Do it with all your heart. It must be enthusiastic with all your heart. As they do it unto the Lord and not unto men. It must be extolling God. And that protects me. Uh, when I work, I work with computers. And whenever I resolve a computer problem, I don't do it just for the sake of my company. I look at my boss, but I don't work for my boss. I work for God. It makes a difference. So that's, I must have told you this before. My boss comes to me one night about 6.30, and my boss asks me, Bing, where did you graduate from? And, of course, I said, I don't have any degree from the United States of America. <laughs> I graduated from a very mission, a small missionary school in the Philippines. It's, uh, and then before I could finish the conversation, I looked my boss in the eye and said, you know, Paul, God gave me this job. And if he wants me to help you, I'm going to work for you. If he wants me to help another firm, I'm going to work for that firm. My boss looks at me, he's an agnostic. He just smiles and he walks away. I don't have to open the Bible to him to be a witness to him, right? All I need to do is make, do an excellent job at work and represent God in my vocation, in my specific calling. And that alone will be a witness to God. Right? <laughs> because when everything is said and done, it's not how much I've done and accomplished for him or how much I make or how, how big my accomplishments are, or where I am assigned. It's not the question of what, am, what do I do. The question is, who am I with? Is Jesus with me? If Jesus is with me, he will take me all throughout. Like Martin Luther said, you may be a street sweeper, you may be a caregiver, you may be a doctor, you might be an attorney, it doesn't matter. All of them are holy before God and must be used for his glory. Then you make their choices within that context, you'll be fine. Yes, uh, Benji. You worked over time, you did it gratis at the glory. What's this? It means to say you did not charge them over time. Oh. For your work. I will give you an example. So when I work, because of the nature of my work, I get called sometimes on a Saturday, right? Because there's a problem at work. You can't go resolve the thing. <clears throat> We have five branches all over the country. If I don't fix the problem, five branches will suffer. How much going on? You know what I do? I do not clock my Saturday time. I go, I go to work, you know, but I do not clock my Sabbath time. And then, then they ask me, why in the world did you charge it? Then I explain to them, no, because I really don't work on the Sabbath day. I mean, I don't work for profit. And that should mean I will not go for it. Remember right I said? Oh, that was credits. Oh, yeah. yeah. What do you call that? What do you call that? Credits at the morning is you need it yeah. free and with love. Pro bono. Yeah, pro bono. Say. Remember? In Latin, it was credits at the morning. All right. 
Hey, when it comes to the Sabbath, remember men? What's men? What are the exceptions to the Sabbath? If mercy calls for it, somebody's dying in the hospital, even if I have opening prayer in Sabbath school, I go to the hospital. I don't come here, right? Because I'm going to help somebody who's dying. If it's an emergency, that, you know, Alfredo had to go home because there was smoke coming out of their basement. <laughs> And the mason was still here. He had to go home, fix some pipe somewhere there. I think it was the heater, the water heater that was going on. You got to go back there. And third is necessity. Is it necessary? If it's necessary, okay, again, based on your priority, it's necessary. And that's why Jesus is saying the law was made for life. Okay? And that's why the Sabbath was made for men and not made for the Sabbath. So I have no issues. But when it comes to a point where I have an exception on the Sabbath, I will try to make it the point that I use that exception to be a witness for God. Are you following? And that's the way you treat your vocation and your calling as a decision, as a choice you make for God, not for yourself. Okay? Well, there is gone. We're, we should have been back to the what about human responsibility and, and uh, divine sovereignty? Suffice it to not, I already discussed this to you. And those who are watching in video, maybe I'll give some <laughs> summary. But we live in the space-time continuum. And so far as God is concerned, we need to respond to Him. We need to make choices. That's what the, what the lesson is saying. Okay, but does the Lord know already what's going on if, even before He make the choice? Does He know? Yes, it does. But does it manipulate your choice? Mm. All right, so the question is, the choice is how in the world can he know and determine it and you are not manipulated? Because there are only certain ways that men will do his. Yeah. The directive, you know? Yeah. The good answer is, uh, when we get to heaven, maybe we can ask him one. <laughs> no, because God knows the pathways of the human yeah. heart. But uh, Benji, I will ask you right now. Before you were born, did God already plan your destiny? Yes. He knew my destiny before I was born. Oh, yes, right. So he knows whether you're going to go to heaven or not, right? My destiny was to be saved. Oh, yes. According to the yes, Bible. yes, okay. So you make it to heaven. Does it mean God forced you to go to heaven? No. It means to say that I made the right decision. Uh, okay. Because the choice is up to me. You have to choose Jesus Christ. Then you'll have eternal life. You only believe. Okay, we, guys, we, did, we, did, we never read this, okay? Uh, I'll just summarize it. Genesis 4 21, basically, Joseph was taken to Egypt. They were sold, right? He was sold. On hot. What a bummer. He said, what kind of life is this? And then, you know, eventually he became the ruler of Egypt. What did Joseph tell his brothers? You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. All right? So God saw the thing. That's a really nice compatibility of human sovereign, divine sovereignty and human responsibility. God could have stopped them from, from selling Joseph to the traders, right? But what if they stopped him? From, then Joseph would have not been to Egypt. And there'll be a famine, he's going to die with Jacob. So Joseph is saying, you, saw it, you thought it was evil, but really it was good because God was preparing me. That's good. Go Acts 2.23, John 10, 17 to 18. Acts 2.23 said, This Christ whom you crucified was foreordained, predestined by God to die on the cross. Question. Even before Jesus was born, was he supposed to die on the cross? Yes. Can anybody stop that? No. Are you following so that means the plan of redemption was manipulated? No. What did Jesus say in John 10? I have the power to lay down my life. I have the power to take it back again. No one takes it away from me. My, from me, I, on my own accord, I lay it down. In other words, freely I give my life. And yet he was predestined. Following? Then remember Acts 27? Uh, uh, you read this, Acts 20, that's not, 20, that's not two, the Acts 27, 31. Paul was setting sail to Rome, and there was a storm that hit the boat, and the boat was about to sink. What Paul said, 
Don't worry, an angel of God came to me and told me I need to go to Rome. So no one in this boat will die. That's what he said. But the, the sailors were so scared, they tried to go to the lifeboats so they can escape. And then what, what Paul is saying, you must stay in the boat. If you don't stay in the boat, you will die. All right, do you get the attention there? Paul said, no one will die in this boat. Okay, but you have to decide to be in the boat. Yeah, what, what, what is the truth? God's servant, he says, no one among those people in the boat will die. Okay, and yet Paul told them, hey, don't get out of the boat, stay in the boat. How do you understand that? When we get to heaven, we understand that, okay. But that's, that's, that's basic, basically what I said. Uh, did God know me before I was born? Yes. And I can only thank God that God already planned. In fact, before I sinned, Jesus already died for me since the foundation of the world. How I understand? I cannot understand that in the light of eternity. I can only thank God for that. But what am I supposed to do? Uh, what I'm supposed to do is, hey, because God died for you and is pursuing you, don't resist what he's trying to do, and you respond to him. If you believe in him, you will have eternal life. If I go back to this diagram, within the space-time continuum, I am responsible in making choices for God. Within the eternal continuum of God, the realm of eternity, God knows the end from the beginning. He has no past. He has no future. Everything is present for him. I cannot reach that dimension. I can only understand that. Hopefully, he gives me some brains when I go to heaven to understand what that means. So he was crucified since the foundation of the world. He knows whether I'm going to go to heaven or not. He knows what's going to happen to me tomorrow or 10 years from now. When I'll die, he's, he's, he knows that already. And yet I don't know that within my space-time continuum. How do I operate? Because I am not God. I will not play God and play his role here. I will play my role within this and make my choices in his honor and his glory from here. That's what our lesson is about. You make your choices here. Okay? What are the choices? Choices to respond to your ultimate calling, to your common callings, and to your specific or particular callings. Once you make that and honor God, then you shall have taken the actual lesson from the quarter for the second Sabbath. All right? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this very practical study. Oh Lord, we cannot avoid it, but we make choices every day. And those choices can either be the right and biblical response to the callings that you've made in our lives. I pray first that we will always remember that it is by responding to your ultimate calling of salvation, the invitation to be your children and to believe in Jesus whom you have sent, and the calling that for us to walk, walk in Jesus the way we receive him, follow his footsteps, follow his principles, that we might really lead a fulfilling life. And the Lord, there are vocational callings among us to be parents, be grandparents, to be children, to be friends, to be employees. Whatever those callings are, dear Father, may it be shaped by the Holy Spirit so that when everything is said and done, we will do it with delight from our hearts in everything that we do, all encompassing and above all extolling and praising and worshipful to you. To this end, dear Father, bless us. And as we teach this to our respective classes this coming Sabbath, may they too be blessed with the principles that we will learn from the scriptures this afternoon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.